Jefferson. So in the history of uh, confessional and creedal documents, this is the first time that adoption has had its own section. It gives you some idea of the importance that uh, reformed people have attached to the doctrine of adoption. So more typically it was connected with justification, but you know, among the, the Westminster divines, the conviction was that it deserved its, its own category and the emphasis that would go along with giving it its, its own separate treatment. So the confession says, all those that are justified, God <coughs> vouchsafeth in and for his only son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption, by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God, have his name put upon them, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as a father, great line, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption, and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. So question number 15, what is the <coughs> difference between justification and adoption? What privileges are ours through adoption? <coughs> but justification is like a courtroom. It's not a relational event. It's a courtroom declaration. And adoption brings us into a family. So justification, if, if that was the only thing that it was, it would be a nice, it would be good to be part of our sins, but we're not brought into the family of God. Right. So, so I think um, to, to the, mo the most correct way to say this, I think, is that adoption is also a verdict. A, a, it, is, it has a judicial dimension. Uh, you've, if you think about human adoption, this takes place in a courtroom, right? You are, um, you know, it's a legal transaction that takes place where you have the right of custody and all the uh, privileges of, of the family, father, child, mother, child relationship. But there's a difference between the relationship to the judge and the relationship to a, a parent. So adoption takes us out of, of merely the associations of the courtroom, like you say, valuable as that would be. That if that were all this were, that would be wonderful. But no, it, it then, it's, this is the judge taking off his robes, throwing his arm around you and taking you home uh, to be his own, his own child. So it's a, it's a much richer, uh, it's a much richer doctrine, richer category in that respect, has more practical implications um, than uh, in terms of how we actually view God and, and the, how we view the Christian life and the perspective, the vantage point from which um, we understand our relationship to God. Am I relating to him as my judge? Well, I don't ever quit doing that, but that is superseded in a sense by understanding that, that God is my father. Well, and even more so important in our time where you know, talked about the fourth identity, this is where we find our identity as children of God through adoption. That, that we don't get that identity through justification. Yes, and there's a book I can recommend that uh, you all read. It's called Who Am I? And <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the author is right. Quite, quite, a, quite a simple development. Yours for only seven ninety five in the, uh, in the church bookshop. Uh, yes, Dan? The, what, what you just mentioned, Ben, is reminding me of a lot of what we said about justification. In justification, we take away the sin, we impute Christ's righteousness. Similarly, justification takes away our condemnation. Adoption establishes us as children of God and joint heirs with Christ. Mm. Yeah, the act that, that had not connected with me. Yeah, I think, the, I think in terms of who am I, um, I mean, is there a more important insight to understand than that God is your father and that you are his child? I mean, the, the ramifications for that, the repercussions. So I recommend to you, I think that's the next question, Packer, yeah, Packer in his book, Knowing God, says that adoption is the key to understanding the Christian life. Do you agree with this and why? Um, I think it's, I think it's uh, absolutely crucial 
for understanding the Christian life. Yes. He, I think he, he excuse me, defines the Christian life as adoption by propitiation. Yeah. Hmm. The two have to go together. So anticipating the connection you just made, Dan. Packer made it in knowing God, adoption through propitiation. And so it's propitiation that makes the, the adoption possible. Without the propitiation, without the declaration of, of justification, without the minus and plus of justification, guilt removed, righteousness credited, there would be no adoption. The, uh, the Roman Catholic idea then of infused <laughs> righteousness would be like God saying, you're, uh, you're only my child if, you, if you're acting like it. Other, you otherwise, can. you're not, yeah. Yeah. which is horrible. <clears throat> So if you lose the status of the justified, which you do in Roman Catholic theology, you would lose the status of adoption along with it. So you're, you're now back outside of the family. And then, you know, again, you go back, you gas up. And you still have Mary. Excuse me? You still have Mary. Mary, yeah. Cool. And she's so it's more, much more approachable. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 the characteristics of God under adoption if, if your point of expression seems so warm and fuzzy, and that, that doesn't seem like that goes along with the, like the, the qualities of God that we've studied. And, you know, um, I wonder who, who, which, of the, which of the aspects of God has, does the warm and fuzzy stuff? Okay, so here's the, here's the ultimate answer. There are no attributes of God. We only speak of attributes because we don't know how to speak otherwise, but God is a whole that is the, the, the sum of all of those attributes together. And, and so he's not just holiness, righteousness, justice, the governor and sustainer. He is also gracious and kind and loving and good and patient and all of that. That's all wrapped up in his essence. So he's not one or the other, right? He's all of that plus. Yeah. yeah. Um. Bunyan makes a really interesting distinction with the fear of God. It's the fear of God. So he goes from when you're justified and when you're adopted, you move from being afraid of God, like a dog that's been beaten or a slave is afraid of the master, to the, the son of filial fear and reverence of, of the father. So you still have this, I don't know if that helps assuage the the idea that this might be warm and fuzzy because this is a father it's affirmative. Uh, so fil fear. that so word filial, that's uh, one of the older writers used all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they would distinguish between fear as terror and filial fear, the fear of a father that is that combines respect and love and a proper kind of <coughs> reverence for one's father um, and, and the, the, you know, the desire not to displease him. Most sons don't, do not want to displease their fathers. They want to please them, even if he's very difficult to please. They want to please him. And so that's important to that whole concept. Yes? Uh, Packer also emphasizes, I just read this chapter actually, um, our, our fellow heirship with Christ, our, our, we are brothers with Christ, and also our familial relationship with fellow believers. We are brothers together with our fellow believers. Brothers, joint heirs with Christ under our Father as well, which is all kind of contained in that adoption. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you emphasizing Christ as elder brother or fellow believers as brothers and sisters? Well, both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Packer talks about both of those. Yeah, um, exactly. And so, so some examples of how this works. So, obedience and pleasing the Father. Um, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the synagogues. I'm going to say this is about prayer, not as uh, about obedience. When they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I see to you, say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Um, so what I am meaning to highlight here in this case 
It's the example of prayer, but it extends to the whole life of the Christian. What is your motivation for prayer, um, and how is it that you pray? So let's start with prayer. How do you pray? How did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father. Father. Right, so it's not the the, the great power uh, out there in the universe. It's not a, it's not, we're not addressing an impersonal power. Uh, we, are, we are addressing a person, and the person that we relate to as a child does to his father. And just, so Jesus goes on, doesn't he, in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, um, and says, when your son asks you for bread, do you give him a rock? When your son asks you for fish, do you give him a scorpion? And if you, being evil, which is to me always interesting, he, <laughs> he assumes that we know that we're evil, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your father who is in heaven. How much more will your father give good gifts to you? And so ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. How do you have that confidence? Well, because you're, you're asking your father. You have the sympathy of a father. You have the pity of a father. You have the love of a father. God is your father. He's not just this vague, distant power, impersonal power that is governing the universe. You are his child, you are a member of his household, you are, in a, you are in the family, he is your father. So when you pray, um, you're, you're, not, you're not gonna pray to be seen on the street corners. Uh, your motivation for praying is uh, that you want to please your father. So you're willing to just go into secret. You're, you're not trying to, in other words, the contrast here is, do you wanna stand on the street corner to be seen by others and please them, have their good opinion? To th and, and in a civilization where, uh, you know, Piety was important, not like our civilization, but first century Judaism, where it was, you know, it was good for your reputation to be seen praying. And so there was a lot of motivation to stand on the street corner and make a big public display of piety. So, um, you know, and prayer, you're commanded to pray. So what's your motivation for praying? Is it, is it to be seen by others or is it to please your father? So th this has broad application, right? Why do we do what we do? What is the motivation of the Christian life? It should be that uh, I want to please my father. All right, how do I interpret, uh, and, and, and why do I have confidence when I pray? Well, because I'm praying to a father. Uh, how about when things go south? How about when I'm suffering? How about when disappointments come? Um, how am I to regard those things? Well, Hebrews 12 teaches us to see those as um, matters of divine discipline. My son, do not regard lightly the, the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves That's and chastens every son whom he receives. So if you are his son, now if you're not his son, he may just uh, turn you over to your sin. And you may just thrive and flourish and prosper all your life and then die and go straight into hell without ever suffering in this world and, and, and having never been disciplined. But if you're a child, you're going to be disciplined. A father uh, if the, whom, the, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And if you are a son, then he's going to chasten, chasten you. So that gives, us a, you know, that gives us a framework, doesn't it, for understanding affliction in this world. If it comes to me, it comes to me by the hand of God. But not just by the hand of God, it comes to me by the hand of God who is my father and who loves me and is caring for me and, 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 and so it, it, uh, it, it is designed for my well-being and, and, and for my good. And, uh, so, um, That's a motivation for obedience as well. Not as, right. high as, not as high as desiring to please the father, but n knowing that my father is not going to let this pass. No. It's, I know that it's going to reap the consequence. So when, when there's affliction, when there's suffering, when there's this disappointment, when there's grief, God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And, but, uh, if, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, all the godly participate in God's discipline, then you are Ill illegitimate children and not sons. That's where you be, need to begin to worry. Besides this, if we had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them, shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined. You see the way this is developed? This is the thought. This is what we're supposed to grasp from, from this. They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplined us for our good that we may, here's the good, share his holiness. 
for the moment all discipline seems painful, it's not fun, we would rather not, uh, rather than pleasant, but yet it yields, here's the other benefit, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's how we're to understand affliction. Um, more on praying to the Father, not just pleasing the Father. Again, there's the, the bread and the fish and so forth. Um, assurance of the Father's care. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never, never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So why? How do we know that uh, we will not lose our salvation, fall away, be cast away, be snatched away? Well, because you are in the hands of our Father in heaven, and those are almighty, omnipotent hands. So the, this chart is in your notes. Um, Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 is teaching us the motivation for, for obedience is to please God. How do we know we're safe? Because we're in the hands of uh, of, 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 of our Father. Suffering, the discipline of our Father. Identity, we are sons of God. Uh, prayer, we touched on already. Church, these are our brothers and sisters. You know, so our whole relationship to the church is a, is a family relationship so that we are brethren. Uh, the men are our brothers. The women are our sisters. We are part of a family. So it's almost, you know, be, you say it's almost difficult to overstress, overemphasize the importance of do adoption for understanding the living of the Christian life and how we relate to God and how we relate to each other. Yes. Could you um, explain how some of the churches, Christian churches like Compassion, believe that you can lose your salvation? Well, well, they, they will take the warning verses of the Bible and they will interpret them to mean that somebody who has been justified can be unjustified and lost. And we take those warning verses of the Bible to mean that there are those who appear to be converted and never truly were. Yeah, the, so the, 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 the seed of the gospel never took root. Or First John 2, they went out from us because they were never of us. Uh, so there are counterfeit believers, there are those who, to whom gospel seed never takes deep root and so they're vulnerable. The weeds choke them out, or the, they're on shallow soil. Um, but they were never, uh, they were never the real thing. Yeah, Hebrews six is the most difficult of those passages, where the, you know they taste of the heavenly gift and so forth. Very hard passage. We'll get we'll get to that when we look at perseverance and assurance and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but that's what they do. So they take those verses to mean that somebody who is of the elect can get unelect. Somebody who's justified can be unjustified. Somebody that's adopted can be kicked out of the family. Isn't, there, isn't there a consistency? So if I, if I choose to be saved, I have the freedom to choose not to be saved at some point. Is that, was that not a consistency? Absolutely. It? Yes. So if it's on me, yes. I, hold, I hold my eternity in my hands. Yes. So the beginning is so Gresham Machen, there's this uh, wonderful section in one of J. Gresham Machen's books, of which you remind me, uh, Matthew, in which he is looking at, at uh, Romans, uh, Romans 8. Um, and he says, I should never, um, I should never try to do this. Um, well, I can't, I can't find the verse off, off the cuff, but what, what he says is that, um, where, where's the, where's, where's in Roman, it called according to his purpose? 828, 29. Oh, all things were together. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Eight, eight, of course it's 828. What am I doing? And we know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good. So he says, now if the verse just said stop there, uh, all things work together uh, for good for those who love God, he said we wouldn't get much assurance out of that. Because we'd be saying, well, do I really love God? 
I don't love God really at all that very much. I, I see the weakness of my love. It, 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 la it lags, it lapses. I, I go cold-hearted, so we'd be, you know, do I really love him or am, or am I just a fake? Am I just a counterfeit? Am I not the real thing? So he says that'd be cold comfort for us. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on and it says, uh, for those who are called, so the effectual call, called according to his purpose. You don't just love God, but you were effectually called by God to faith in Christ. And so it's not just your decision. It was, it was God's election, his electing call upon you that is your security. These things are working together for good, not just because you love God, which, again, that, that waxes and wanes. No, it's because you were called sovereignly by God according to his purpose. Um, and so we're, our security is anchored in his decision, not our decision, which is the point you were trying to, trying to make. Yeah, our, our safety, our security is, is in the decision of God to have us, not in our decision to have him. That would be weak comfort if it were up to our decision, because what we once decided, we could undecide. But if it's God's decision, uh, and that his will is unchanging, he's immutable, he's eternal, then that's, that's a thing that cannot be lost. Terry, okay. one other thought on this being a key element of understanding the Christian life is, if you want a doctrine that is a Christian doctrine in contrast to other religions, it's adoption and the fatherhood of God. Mm -hmm. Those are not concepts from any other religion unless they appropriate it from Christianity itself. So if you want a Christian doctrine, adoption is maybe a preeminent Christian. So there's no nothing quite like that in Islam. Nothing really in the Eastern religions remotely like it. Um, nothing, um, yeah, not, yeah, there's, uh, even Judaism lacks, you, you know, what was one of the ironies uh, when, um, you know, when, when our kids were at Country Day, they used to have someone pray at uh, the beginning of the games, and they would invite dis different ministers, and I would always say, well, I'm only going to pray if I can pray in Jesus' name, and I try to explain, you know, that that's, just to be an that's a Christian prayer that we're to be obedient and all that, and they would say, no, you need to do a, make a non-denominational prayer. So I said, so you want a Unitarian prayer or a Jewish prayer? No, no, it's a Christian prayer. I said, well, I, no, it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not a, it's just a generic, what am I, it's a generic prayer. It, that's, it's not a Jewish prayer or un, universalist prayer, it's, a, it's just a generic prayer. I said, no, no, it's Unitarian. It's not Christian, <laughs> and and so and so I said I, I can't. I did it. I did a couple of times, and and there was enough complaint about it that they didn't ask me again. So, so then, so just, then, just like when he was at the sorority. Yeah. So then, so then, like the next game, the headmaster prayed, and he started out, our father. Our father. So, being the, the. Um, Knuckle. <laughs> I went up to him later and said, your prayer was a Christian prayer. There's no one else who calls God Father. I'm sorry. That's the way Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You didn't avoid praying a Christian prayer when you prayed our Father. It's true, though. Yes. Continue about uh, adoption and the church and because we'll be taking communion this Sunday. For me, as someone who doesn't biologically have any siblings, it is very meaningful, even if I don't pass Frankie in, in the lane and call him Brother Frankie, to sit down with my brothers and sisters in Christ at the communion tables, the way that we celebrate communion here, I do find very meaningful. Meaningful. In a family sense. Yes. And sitting down at the tables, um, in the middle of the aisle, yeah, yeah. it is <coughs> going to be said for that. One, one more on justification. I yes. mean, uh, adoption. Would you, would you say the story of Mephibosheth in the Old yeah. Testament is yeah. a good picture of adoption? Mephibosheth. Yeah. And he, he was he was lame in both legs. He was both feet. He was brought to the king's table to eat at the king's table regularly. I mean, that's a pretty good picture of a Christian, huh? Of of adoption. Yeah. Uh, of being in the covenant, you know, because only because David made a covenant with his grandfather. Yeah.
Mephibosheth. Yeah, Mephib he's talking about Mephibosheth um, being Saul's son being brought into the uh, the household and uh, granted the uh, the right of the table. And what what were you saying there, Matthew? He said in his deformity, the thing that yeah. his, his broken feet were hidden by the king's table. That'll preach, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that and that it is in a sense the emphasis of the story. That's the way the story ends. The story ends with that he was blaming other people. Then he betrays Ab during Absalom's rebellion, he goes with Absalom. Yeah, uh, he's he's deceived. That story is the greatest deletion of the Jesus storybook Bible. How in the world would that not be in there? We're not gonna answer that tonight, Frankie. <laughs> All right, uh, question 17, moving on to uh, sanctification. What is the difference between justification and sanctification? Why is it important that these not be confused? Well, we would want to say, first of all, justification and sanctification are inseparably linked. All those who are justified are also sanctified, but we have to keep them separate and, and keep them distinct. So here's what the confession says. Those they who are once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified, really and personally, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. By his word and spirit dwelling in them, the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they more... Um, and they more and more, and they more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. As the sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life, there still abiding some remnants of corruption in every part, where whence and ar ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war. The flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh in which war, although the remaining corruption for a time, may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate, the regenerate part doth overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So sanctification... What's the difference between the two? One, one is final, and in that finality, it puts us in a place to engage in the process of sanctification. So sanctification is something we live throughout life and, and progress towards. Yes. So this chart, it's also in your notes, it may help. It's similar to the justification chart, but um, so we want to talk about how it, uh, some very basic errors are made on either side of the re Reformed and traditional Protestant view by others. So justification is by faith alone. Sanctification is faith plus effort. Okay, uh, justification, faith is passive. It's just empty hands receiving the gift of God as we put our trust in Christ for our salvation. Uh, in sanctification, faith is active. Uh, justification is a declaration. Sanctification is a process, lifelong. Um, justification is a verdict of righteousness. Sanctification is an infusion of righteousness. It's grace being received, spirit, uh, the spirit energizing. Uh, justification is the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Sanctification is the imparting of righteousness. Justification is complete. Sanctification is partial or incomplete. Uh, sin is curbed but not cured, says Watson. Uh, justification is immediate. Sanct sanctification is lifelong. So Murray, I think, very helpfully defines regeneration as sanctification begun. So it's the transformation of our nature in regeneration that starts the process of sanctification. So the regenerate put their faith in Christ and are justified, and this new nature then begins to live out 
a life that is compatible uh, with their Father in heaven. So larger catechism number 77, if you want to consult that uh, later, it, um, it, it, it actually directly answers that question. It di directly addresses the question of the difference between justification and sanctification. 18, is sanctification our work or God's work? Explain how sanctification can be imperfect in this life and yet produce true holiness without which no man may see the Lord. It is God's work, according to the Catechism, the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's our work based on God's work. God's work enables our work to be sanctified, not to save ourselves, but to grow in holiness. So, th so this distinction between justification and sanctification is absolutely crucial. We don't work toward our justification. It's a declaration. It's a verdict. We do work toward our sanctification to become more holy, and that means we mortify the flesh, we put sin to death, and so forth and so on. So the definitive side of, of sanctification, we can see it here where the, the bondage to sin is broken. There was this enslaving, controlling um, uh, power of sin that kept us in chains and in bondage. So in Romans 6, the Apostle Paul says, okay, that's been broken. You're no, you're no longer in bondage. You've been released. You've been freed so that a holy life is now possible because of the power that was released in the death of Christ and of which you have been the benefit. Yes? So is this like a custody case, like a custody court, where we go to court and we're justified with the, like the banging of the gavel, and then we're able to go home with the judge? Yes. Is that like a fair analogy? Yes, except we're going beyond that now with sanctification. So n now we're living in the Father's house, and we're, be we're now to become imitators. Uh, e Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, be imitators of God as, as his beloved children. Huh? Doesn't that tie that all together? Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love even as Christ has loved you. So Romans 5, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that the old self was crucified with him. The old self, the old person that we were, the old, um, the, the old uh, man who was in bondage to sin. Okay, that person was crucified, the body of sin brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For sin shall have no dominion over you, since you were not under law but under grace. So there's this definitive thing that's taken place. We call it regeneration. Um, we, you, you were born again. You were born of the Spirit. You became a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You became a new person, a new creation, no longer in bondage, no longer enslaved, no longer under the dominion. That old person that you were is dead crucified. All right, so, but Romans 6 is followed by Romans 7, and there he's talking about the fight and the battle. He talks about here in verse 22, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, so that there are, there are these remnants of sin that we continue to do battle with. So if you make the distinction, the bondage is broken. The controlling, enslaving power of sin has been broken. So now there is potential for true holiness, but you still have the remnants of that fallen nature within you, which you will fight with for the rest of your life. So here are the kinds of things the Bible says to us. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. So you're regenerate. Uh, you've been born again. You're a Christian. You're a disciple of Christ. Uh, do you still have uh, do you ha still have remnants of a fallen nature in you? You sure do. Um, so there are these passions of the flesh, and they're a problem, and they're waging war against you. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 and 17. I say, walk by the Spirit, and, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires. This, this, this word in the older versions was a stronger word, and I, I wish they had retained it in the ESV. It's the lusts of the flesh are against the spirit. And this is why they did, I think, to, 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 to carry the, the translation consistently. But the desires of the spirit, the lusts of the flesh, anyway, are against the flesh, for these two are opposed to each other. And here's what will happen. They will keep you from doing the things that you want to do. 
Uh, Colossians 3, 5. Three, five, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Put them to death. So these things have not disappeared. They didn't vanish because you became a Christian. Uh, even though you were born again, that doesn't mean that you're, you're not still plagued with the desire for sexual immorality, impurity. You continue to be a fight against your passions, evil desire, covetousness, uh, and uh, idolatry. So what, what, what do we do about that? Well, they have to be put to death. You can't toy with them. You can't flirt with them. Uh, you can't pretend as though they are, are not a problem or an, or an <coughs> issue or, or something that uh, you can, you can uh, treat with in, indifference uh, or uh, ignore. No, you've got to put these things to death. So back to John Owen. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It, sin will kill your soul, so you better kill it before it kills you. Uh, Galatians 5.24, the, um, there the apostle Paul says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then uh, the famously Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, therefore take up the full, the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. We are wrestling. We're in a fight. We're in a battle. We're in warfare. So we need, we need the armor of God if we're going to be able to withstand. Um, you know, the Apostle Paul, uh, Philippians 3, 12, and 14, where he says he's not arrived, he presses on. He, he understands. To live the Christian life, you've got to press on. You've got to keep up the fight, keep up the battle, mortify the flesh, put sin to death. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's warfare, it's battle. So I think the way to understand sanctification is this graph. If this is uh, growth and holiness on, on this uh, axis and time, what, the, the living of the Christian life is like a wave graph. So you're, go, you're going three steps forward, and then, you, then, and then you're two steps back. Three forward, two more back. Three forward, one back. Four forward, three back. So, but, but if you graph, the, the overall trajectory is what? Over time. It's growth and holiness. So that gradually, over time, more and more, we are overcoming sin. We're overcoming that lust. We're overcoming that anger. We're overcoming that jealousy and envy. Those passions are being put to death. Those sinful, evil desires and passions and attitudes and outlook, they're all being put to death by the power of the Holy Spirit, by virtue of the benefits of Christ's death. Still, question 16. No, we're through. Um, all right, 17. Hey, Terry. Yes. Since, since Catholics refer to justification much in the same way that we think of uh, sanctification, what, what do they believe, I guess, about sanctification? Do they just want to blend the two of those together? Or, does that make sense? They are blended together. So my, my classmate, Steve Wood, who was at Gordon-Conwell with me, he converted to Roman Catholicism. And in one of the articles he wrote, he said, the Catholic the doctrine, he's appealing to lay people, so he says the Catholic doctrine is much better because in justification, you also get sanctification. You get them all together. Well, we get them together, but we keep them separate so that we don't think our justification is dependent upon our sanctification. Um, so, um, so I need a blank piece of paper to, to, to to, to contrast two, two things. Roman, the Roman Catholic view confuses <coughs> justification with sanctification and makes justification a process. That's the problem. Does sanctifica is sanctification always connected to justification? Yes, always. If you are justified, you will be sanctified. They are infallibly, invariably connected together. You are born again, you come to faith in Christ, you begin to grow in Christ-likeness and grow in holiness. 
is justification, however, takes place in a moment of time. Sanctification is a process. They confuse justification with sanctification, turn it into a process so that it is never complete. They are the same thing. Okay, so they don't make a distinction. They don't make a distinction. Okay. Justification is sanctification. Sanctification is justification. It's all wrapped up together. And so it is a process, and so it is never complete. And so you never do know. And in fact, it, the, the Trent, definitive Roman Catholic doctor, it anathematizes those who have assurance of salvation. They say you cannot have assurance. Why not? Because you can never know if you're justified. You can't know that because it's a process, and it's always incomplete. And you don't know if it's complete enough to get a, to get a, a final verdict. And, and since, since, you know, since you're just a normal guy, you're, you just hang it up. You're not going to make it. You're no, you're no super saint, so you're going to end up needing. Which means that Paul in Romans 4 is writing to nobody. <laughs> when he says, how blessed is the man who the Lord will not credit as sin, according to Rome, that's not, well, OK. It's, one answer was he was talking about Jesus. That doesn't quite work because there's no sin to not credit against him. But he's writing to nobody. <laughs> and if they say it in the negative, they're saying you can never know. Why don't they just say you can know that you'll never be justified? <laughs> Why don't yeah. they just say it in the positive? I don't, you don't have to have it. Then send them all. Maybe they do. I <laughs> <laughs> send them all running doves. <laughs> there is an article at Trent that pronounces an anathema on people who claim you can have assurance of salvation. And to them, that's pride, that's arrogance, that's, um, that's self-righteousness. Uh, that's something you cannot know. Because it's based on works. Because it's work. Yeah. Yeah, there's more, more problem to this because of purgatory, too, because purgatory muddles the glorification. So apparently, justification and sanctification are also an issue after death. And so they have no assurance of glorification either. That's that's made unclear. So, well, I think that they're certain they don't have it, and that's why they have to be purged for, of the sin that would prevent glorification. So that's why, and and I mean, in, in, at least in the older writings, I mean, you're talking 150, 200 thousand years in purgatory. That's why you know when a coin in the coffer rings a soul from Purgatory Springs, Aunt Mabel. That's a huge inducement. Aunt, Aunt Mabel's got another hundred thousand years to go. And Charlie, if you would just donate the money, you can spring Aunt Mabel right out of there right now. You have no compassion. <laughs> you have any compassion at all for Aunt Mabel? You're gonna you're going to spring her. Yes. But then that raises the question: If it could spring her out of heaven, then it's not good works for you. It's good work to credit it to her. Right. Yeah, why can't I buy an indulgence for myself? <laughs> yeah, I don't know enough. I don't, I don't know enough about indulgence theology to answer that question. Could you? Well, well I can't because I don't have any money. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it is still part of Catholic theology. Thanks, Jay. It is. I mean, the idea of buying indulgences is strongly disfavored. But the concept of the indulgence well, remains still to stands. this day. Still stands. You don't hear much about it, but you did when uh, Benedict was pope. He was a very traditional Catholic, and you did hear some things about indulgences. And uh, pope, uh, pope John Paul, you know, talked about, um, you know, we need to do more praying to Mary. You need to, he was a traditional Catholic. You needed to, you know, get back to confession. You can't just confess your sins to Christ. You need to go pr pray through a priest and, uh, you know, really try to restore ro traditional Roman Catholic piety. All right, so the other side is Keswick. Oh. Keep preaching, we'll all be wearing orange on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For the orangemen, the, the uh, anyway. All right, the Keswick, Keswick higher life, victorious life, confuses justification, sanctification with justification. It's the, other, it's the opposite error. So Roman Catholics turn justification into a process. So justification becomes a process. Keswick turns sanctification into a verdict or into a uh, instant, instantaneous event. So they, 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 this, is a, this is a movement that's very popular in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. It's named for a town in England, Keswick, where conferences were held. And you see, rem you, see, you see some of this in the Campus Crusade material that was produced in the 60s and 70s. 
uh, and their concept of spiritual breathing. Um, and if you breathe, you breathe out your sin and you breathe in the Holy Spirit. And How was that little blue? The blue book, the bird book. Yeah, we called it the bird book. Um, but, but the idea here is if you have enough faith, uh, then you can reach a plateau at which you will no longer struggle in the Christian life. And if you're struggling, it's because you haven't yet had the second blessing. All right, so the first blessing was your salvation. But there is this second blessing to be had, the second work of grace. So this is in Wesley and the whole Wesleyan tradition. Second event of grace, whereby you are catapulted up into a, a, a new a, a new sphere uh, of life for the Christian where you no longer struggle with sin. Uh, so at Gordon Conwell, we had a, a, a Wesleyan professor who visited and declared to the class he hadn't sinned in 20 years. He said that with a straight face. Uh, and uh, you know, everybody wanted to meet his wife. And, and <laughs> said, uh, said, Tell us about Dr. So-and-so. Has he really not sinned? So they end up redefining sin as, as a conscious act, and he, th he didn't consciously sin, uh, <laughs> sin ever. But one of the writers that we know who has written, ex uh, wrote extensively against this view, it's in no he writes against it in Knowing God, and he wrote uh, you know, a sizzling uh, um, article against it in the 1950s and got himself uh, banished from the evangelical what do they call it in England? E Evangelical Journal, Evangelical Times, I, I forget what it's called, a in which um, he felt like as a young man he was victimized by this view, that if you just had enough faith, Jim, you would not be struggling with your sin. So you just need to pray. You just need to trust God. You just need to let go and let God. And if you were properly yielded and surrendered and yielded up yourself to God, you would, you would then ascend up into this, this realm where you would... The Christian life would be uh, smooth sailing for the rest of your life. This you sounds know. awfully reminiscent of the uh, prosperity gospel today. If, if you just had enough faith. Yeah, yeah, except, yeah, that's materially directed, and this is in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how, how uh, the, the, the capacity to live the Christian life. Uh, Ollie? You no, know, isn't it worth saying if, if we point out? You know, as it has this instantaneous sanctification view, that we do also hold to the, the category of a definitive sanctification. You know, so um, I don't think <coughs> it's under standards, but yeah, I think Murray talks about it, people like Babbing. So normally when we talk about sanctification, we, we're doing exactly what we talk about, a process, gradual gaining in hope, holiness. Uh, that's what we would call pro progressive sanctification. But we do have a category of definitive sanctification, which is the initial, when you become a believer, the definitive breach with the past life. Um, the step in, you know, that sense. Of, so I think we do, we do have a, a category of a definitive sanctification, right. but it's not what they're talking about. Right, that's what I was alluding to in looking at Romans 6, is right. that they're... they're uh, regeneration is sanctification begun with this uh, good language, definitive breach with sin. That is in, this is in Murray. He, so he distinguishes between definitive sanctification, which is regeneration basically, in which you, you are transformed and given the capacity now to live a, a holy life, which then that whole life is progressive. Yes. Sounds like a dimmer switch. <laughs> it's on and off, and it's low and it's high. <laughs> Terry, that that, um, that spirit-filled life uh, booklet is is still in use by Campus Crusade, um, written by Bill Bright, of course. But it's ex it's the exact thing that we remember back in the seventies. All right, we're overtime. Class dismissed.